So, welcome. So, uh, the workshop in Python. I'm hoping people went through the um, the link that was set out, as well as the guide. loops and a key thing to the people coming from an IDL background the way um, code is organized in Python as well as some little notes on pros and cons of Python and the fact that there's two different Python versions just a little thing to mention so start out with um, in Python in a nutshell um, if you have the terminal open, like here, I'd like you to run Python, or Python 3, or just Python. Alternatively, you can use IPython to try on this. Um, and then import this. This little poem. <laughs> Let me make this a little small. Ah. Import this. This little poem basically summarizes the philosophy that goes in the, in the Python. Um, so simplicity, the simplicity as a virtue, the, some of the important ones, um, sacrifices will be made to <coughs> the language to make sure that readability counts in the face of ambiguity basically make you be explicit so explicit better than implicit um, one of the main things this line there should be one and for the only one obvious way to do it so Python is a language so Perl is a language designed by linguistic um, some of the like study linguistics, that, that's Perl. Python is a language by someone who really likes um, being very opinionated on how a language should be uh, in terms of simplicity. Um, and the person who made it is Dutch, so I think from 92, the update's from. So, Python, despite all the statements, Python ends up being very flexible, uh, taking a lot from other programming languages, other paradigms of programming. These would probably sound like a lot of buzzwords, aspect-oriented, object-oriented, um, 
in the design by contract. Uh, you can program in a lot of different styles in other languages. And Python takes the approach of being master of none, um, but taking influence from quite a bit. Also, <clears throat> so, so when I first became aware of Python, um, about 10 years ago or so, uh, it was a language used so that you would write the logic in some nice, simple language of your program, and then replace it with C as you get closer and closer um, to actually needing a finished product. Eventually, people just stopped replacing it with C, but uh, Python still carries that strong integration with C. And Fortran calling conventions are compatible with C likewise. Um, so there's a lot of, um, so even if you're using Python programs, you call C libraries a lot, and many of the things that you do, especially in science, you want some fast language doing your core operations. And Python was, has a lot of design into it to make that very uh, convenient. So this is the uh, anti-Perl feature of Python. Um, there should be only one way to do things. Perl is a language where the motto is there's more than one way to do things. Uh, so in Python, though, the goal is that there's some somewhat obvious way to write a program. So if you have some idea what the logic should be, going from that to a program should be straightforward. Whether that happens in practice, Depends on your experience and whatnot, and the problem. But that's the goal. It's also a very small core language. Um, there's very little that you can do right away. So we'll talk about how you uh, how, how you're able to access more code. Some of it written in C, some in Python, um, some in Fortran. Uh, but the core language itself, the thing that happens when you just type Python or Python 3 is actually very small and simple and the simplicity is uh, design cold. So from here I'd like to talk about I'd like to actually show how you run Python, uh, how you exit. So I'm going to make this a little bigger. I'm going to make a file that just prints hello world. This is a very traditional, and I'm going to call it script.py. You can use a text editor, and I think in Windows uh, you have to, unless you have Siglin or something open. Um, just make hello and in quotes whatever message you want to do. And that's, okay, that's the simplicity of Python. If we run Python or Python 3 on this file, it does the command. That's a simple way. If you're going to use Python interactively, you can just type it or type Python 3. And likewise, use the commands. So here's the um, hello world, the traditional first program. I so so this is actually important. The interface that you have here. I can add a little bit of a history. I can I can press the up and down arrows to do stuff. There's not much more to this, right? If I exit, so I've asked everyone to install IPython. I'm going to run IPython 3. IPython is a little more powerful, actually quite a bit more powerful. If you're familiar with IDL, running Python is like running IDL. You can type commands, that's it. IPython, you can also do the same. You can type Python commands. 
You can also, well, these little um, tricks to make it much more convenient. So, exclamation points and then some commands. For instance, runs that command in the in the Unix shell or Windows shell. Um, yeah. So, in Windows, I think you have to do that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll talk about what it list is later, but I can say what is the second command that I inputted. I can get, um, I can use a lot of history editing stuff. I can use Emacs keys in here. Um, I have Python it allows you to do a lot of interactive stuff, including if I type the name of something and do a question mark, I get the help for it. So the three things in Python have gone over so far is running the, running the program, um, printing hello world, and getting help. So this will look di slightly different in Python 2 and 3. Any questions? Uh, just starting, uh, just starting um, Python so you can run commands. The last thing I want to talk about, and this is a really, this is so useful when they even use it with, um, with IDL. If you're familiar with Mathematica, to use Mathematica interactively, you start a notebook, and um, you type commands into it, and those commands are saved as you're running, as you're, uh, as you work. And then you can always pull up, pull that back up and see all the uh, commands and outputs that you gave. So this is a very nice workflow for Mathematica. IPython supports that. IPython, or IPython 3 notebook. And so in your, um, So on Windows, I guess you would just do the shortcut. It tells you a lot of things. You can see by a bouncing Firefox icon that it loaded something up for me in Firefox. It is off the screen, but that's okay. Show it that it's not what I meant to do. I'll make sure I can actually copy it this time. So it gives you a list of files, some of them potentially IPython notebooks. I'm going to hit the new button on the upper right there. Uh, older versions of IPython, you might just hit new. This one, I'm going to say new and then IPython 3. And then you have a very math, uh, mathematical style uh, way of keeping the interactively using Python and keeping track of what you're doing. So, for instance, actually the, yeah. the notebook for the Windows is like a completely separate executable, so you have to open it up separately. You can't just do it in one. Oh, yeah. Shell, you were just in or whatever. So, like, I have, you just have, like, have like two of these, one's the notebook, yeah, so you, you have my Python running. Yes. So so notice I quit a, I quit IPython first and then I ran the notebook. Right. But yeah, the notebook pops up its own has its own um, its own messages. Right. Um, which actually tells you a little about how to use it and what software it's using. This is an interesting. So, this is one of the advantages of Python or Python software. You can use it and share it very easily from a website. Although they're working on making this, um, taking this IPython and make, applying it to other languages. Oh. 
this a little bigger. Okay. So for the rest of this talk, I'm going to, um, or for the rest of this workshop, I'm going to put everything <coughs> in the IPython notebook. You also can. And whatever name you want for the notebook, you can set that here. Let's say, first day workshop. And there will be a file called first day workshop. I P Y N D, I think. Um, and so you have a detailed log of everything. Uh, you've done thing. One of the anyone run into any issues with it? Yeah. I can get the notebook to come up. Oh, right. When you okay. Thanks, Terrence. Wow. It's, uh, Everyone else able to print Hello World inside the notebook? So. If you don't, I don't, I don't know if that's how you got it. Who has a notebook up? Some feedback here. I can <laughs> see notebooks on some of the screens that I can see from where I'm sitting. Okay, good. So, so notebooks are open. Are you able to get it to print Hello World? Okay, good, good. The nodding's good. doing print hello world and then enter doesn't work? Yeah. yeah. It's like mathematical. Yes. So, so, I hope someone asked about that. Yeah, so you can print, you can do multiple lines in here um, to run the whole thing as in Mathematica. Shift enter is the um, key. So this is a longer sample, print, I am multi-line, and shift enter to actually run this uh, piece of code. So if you're familiar with Mathematica, same type of, uh, same, uh, it's, this is basically ma uh, mathematical influence. And as with Mathematica, as with MATLAB, as with C, as with Java, um, you have variables. So I can say it's three, I can say B is five, six point whatever, I can say C is hello world, and I can print out A, print out B, Print out C. And it does all this. It automatically adds to the line. Yes. In um, Python 2 and 3, you can suppress that. It's slightly different um, how to suppress it. But yeah, it adds in the line. Okay. So it's like print L line and print out one. Are there any conventions as in Fortran for integers and strings? Um, Everything is loosely typed. So loosely typed. Yeah. So oh. vari variables don't have a type with them. Okay. So. Oh, do you mean like the, uh, the variable names? The variable names, possibly, but I'm thinking too. Just of your n equals three. There is that stored as three to n. And you give it something that turns into that you could turn into an integer. Um, likewise, float, 
float and something that turns into a flip. Um, the rules for what types of things can go in here to be converted, I'm not sure. I think it's just strings and things that you can treat like strings. So I think it turns this float into a string and then turns that into an integer. Um, but actually, we can look at the documentation. which comes up in this nice um, split window in my Python notebooks. Um, Can you show again how to come up with this? Yeah. I just um, did ints and then question mark. Show the documentation for the int function. Here we go. So it needs to be a number or a basis given. So it needs to be a number or it should be a string, a byte, or a byte array. Um, yeah. So it doesn't convert between a lot of things. It converts from strings and numbers. And I think there's a little x here. Get out of there. So these numbers. Python also, also supports complex numbers using the um, engineering notation. So with a J in it, and if I print B, yeah, it normalizes the appearance of it. If you do 4 times J, it thinks j is a variable, and in my case, it will say j is not defined. So, that's some support for um, some support for complex numbers if that ever comes up in your work. And actually, as a little prelude to later. Uh, these numbers, they have information about them. I can get the imaginary component by doing v.imag. Likewise, I get the real component, v.real. I can see what option, what things I'm able to do. And this is something that IDL does not have that makes Python very powerful. I can do and the regular Python does not have. I can do B dot and then press tab and I see my options. So conjugate looks like a good one, which I think is a method. And if, it, if I didn't know that, I could just type it and I find out it's a function. Likewise, A is three. A has a lot of stuff. No, oh. including the two bytes method. Yeah. In terms of comparing it to Mathematica, how complex can like Python get? So remember, um, I said it's a small language. Oh, okay. So built in, very little. Okay. Uh, very, very low complexity. The I don't, Terence. You're not talking about SymPy, right? Right. Okay. You're, you're not talking about it. Well, you're going to just give a glimpse of it. OK. So you get a glimpse of something comparable to Mathematica's um, ability to do symbolic manipulation. Right. So have an equation with things that aren't known yet. Yeah. Um, so there is software to do that in Python. I've never used that in okay. Python. Um, yeah. It does exist, not in the core language. But obviously, if you're doing something crazy huge, Python's probably not the language to do it in. I'm not sure. I think it would depend on your what you're doing. I don't know how performance of SymPy compares to Mathematica. From a like V 
theoretical standpoint, the languages are equivalent in power. Anything that one can solve, the other can solve. Whether or not it takes more memory or more time, I don't know. Right. Um, so yeah, I, I don't have an answer to that. It's the symbolic manipulations. That's something I've done. But it is possible. Python seems to be a language that is an entry language for a lot of image work, creation and processing. Mm -hmm. How, if it's this simple, what, uh, what are its image characteristics in some sense? I guess what I'm trying to say is, There, there is more to it uh, when we go into how how you load external code, which can be in C and Fortran. One thing too, yeah. So, so integers and floats in Python. Uh, I haven't said details about how many but how many bits they take up. And in integers in particular, um, we don't know that. And th they could take. It's platform specific as well as um, just how big an industry you have. So that's not really conducive for very high performance computing and the software that um, Terrence talked about does not approach it that way. So it does not use the integers built into Python. One cell. Let's see the Fortran. What about arrays? Arrays? So I will get to. Actually, yeah, I was going to cover. I was going to cover functions, but I can do it. So in Python, there are three three ways of structuring data. Um, that's made up of multiple parts, I guess. An array is not directly in Python. So it's something, and this is again something Terrence will talk about next time, something similar to the list with a capital L in Java, or a linked list in other languages, although it doesn't necessarily have to be a linked list. Um, are what are called list objects in Python. And those can be made up of data. And they're basically, they're just filled in with a, um, or created with the brackets. So let's, let me actually put a comment here. Create a list. And I can print out the list. So it's not, it's not quite the same as an array for a couple reasons. One is that if I do dots and then tab to see what functions are available, the first one is that I can add to it. I can also pop things off it. I can insert them. Um, sort, reverse these things. Well, I guess those could be done with arrays without changing the size. Um, but you're able to manipulate an array. And the second reason these are not, or you're able to manipulate lists. The second reason that a list is not an array, in the sense of what an array is in Fortran, you can have multiple types of things in there. So I had a lot of integers. Now I'll add a float, add a string, and if I print this out, the list is basically a container, an ordered container of things. Can you do an operation on a list? Very. Uh, besides looping over it and sorting it. Now. In built-in Python, so so in the very core of the language, um, yeah, 
And so these are kind of slow to work with, and I think I'm not sure if you'll talk about why that is. Yeah. So we can talk about it. Okay, so without stepping on one of tomorrow's talk, uh, workshop too much, um, you basically don't want to put all your data in here and work with it on this level, um, on the level of lists. But one thing you can do, so th this each line is numbered in and then brackets. Actually, before I do that, print things in my list. Before I do that, I'll just say that all lists, let's grab the fourth thing. So this starts 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. It's 0 base, like C. Now let's change this, let's grab the sixth thing. So, uh, use a solid bracket, I guess the hard bracket, the non-angle bracket, um, to pull things out of the list. Including, this is kind of a nice thing about IPython, I don't know, the third thing I typed in, which is a two-line string. Or the sixth, sixth thing. Not explicitly said here, there's also a list called outs that gives you um, whatever the last line outputted, if anything. Which has this number. So you can get your results without recalculating it. A useful, um, useful list in IPython. So, so you would use list um, in places, especially in Python 2, you use list quite a bit in places you use arrays. And you get a performance penalty because list can be any size, they're not, um, they're not, it, it's an expensive operation to grow them, potentially. Um, and you can't optimize functions over them because you don't know if they have the same type. So, so that's the uh, kind of Python equivalent of arrays that are used if you're not doing any heavy, um, any heavy data manipulation. Other alternative. So these are called dictionaries in Python. The this, there we go. This guy here mentions them that way too. If you're familiar with other languages, these are also called associative arrays or hash, hash arrays or hash tables. Um, dictionaries, instead of referring to things by the number that they're in, you refer to them by some name. Traditionally, strings. So for instance, let's say I wanted to encode information about myself. And you could fill in whatever you feel applicable. All the information about myself, I have a name for that, as well as the value. And I can fill this in. Inches. So these are very, used very much like lists are, but instead of referring them as the zeroth one, the first one, the second one, you have the age, the heights, the eye color. In this example. So I can print the whole thing. And I can print specific, specifically get one of these, um, one of these labeled values. 
And yeah, like just like lists, you can change this information. So I could add, um, I don't know, what else is about me? Uh, I think my weight is probably like 170 pounds. Feel free to keep that off your. Feel free to keep that off your um, notebooks. That's sensitive. <laughs> um, but the point is, these uh, dictionaries are readable, <coughs> and they use quite a bit in Python to pass around more structured data of. Um, Basically, have name values. <coughs> so. The thing that I really want to talk about to mention so in Python, so, so in most languages, you have the concept of functions. Python, likewise. My function. So something that does that runs some code. So, I don't know, and, and C, this would be the same as um, void by function bracket So I just want to compare Python to C. <coughs> Too many differences. In Python, there's no type, so this void means it doesn't return anything. In Python, we don't even um, talk about what the types of our of the things that are returned are given. Um, the other thing to note is that in C. You use these brackets to say what's part of the function. So a simpler, well, a one-line method could look like this. And it's perfectly valid to see. In Python, um, Python doesn't use bracket or braces. It uses white space. So one of the more, con I would say controversial, because either you're used to it or you're not. Live with it, is that it matters how much white space you use, um, or it matters the white space because Python figures out what's inside your function, what's inside your loop, etc., based on that white space. So, can that my function have an argument? Yeah, yeah. Next example. So I'll run this with all the C code commented out. You can run my function. Um, so I use spaces here. I don't like doing that. I like using tab. I like using tab. That's could get me burned at the stake at some places. Um, Python doesn't care as long as you're consistent. So just make sure you use a tab or spaces and the same number of spaces, um, and it will figure that out. So, yes, about actually giving data to the function. So let's do something actually useful here. So, let's calculate that hypotenuse. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not gonna try to spell that. <laughs> Side one, what's the formula for that? Anyone? Square root? Yes. Square root plus B squared. Yeah, it's because, you know, side 1 squared plus side 2 squared. Oh, true. Side 1 squared plus side 
2 squared and then square root of that, so raised to the 0.5. Um, just like uh, just like in most other languages, you just return. Which is the same as print here, essentially. Oh no, they're just no, they're they're finishing, the, finishing the function. Right. Okay. Yeah, so it knows I finished the function when I've returned to the um, when I'm no longer indented. So I can use prints. Yeah. The two asterisks is exponentiation. Yeah. I think the same convention in Perl. I know that languages use that. Yeah. So yeah, star star books. Is the carrot used for anything? I think the carrots I think that I think the carrot um won't work here because it's used for uh, comparing bit by bit. Um, is it? Yeah, some logic or set. Like it does XOR, like it does the exclusive OR with two numbers. I think that's the case. Yeah, I think that's a logical, uh, a logical operation. Yeah. So, what's the return so value? of my function, and what's the return value of the uh, hypotenuse function? So, we can actually try that. But now you want to show in values, right? Such as 3 and 4. Well, if we do, print my function. Any guesses? It doesn't know what side 1 is and side 2 is. No, no, that's, I didn't do hypotenuse. I did this one without a return statement. So there is a, a thing in Python, um, kind of of the same sort of ugliness as null is in C, um, called none. So you call the function, it does hello world, and it returns none. So, yeah, so none. I'm not sure if everything in Python returns something, but every function returns something, even if it's not. But, yeah, to go back to Hypothesis. So, three, four. Three, four, five, yeah. Oh, the Pythagorean triples. All right, so I think because I raised it to the 0.5 that it's giving you a floating number. Yeah. Yeah. And likewise, I could give it a floating number and integer, and because it doesn't, Python is really fast and loose with the types. It doesn't care. Um, and this is a characteristic of Python as opposed to, well, for numbers, most languages will convert things to floats. Um, there's a characteristic of Python. If things should work, the code is structured so that it will work. Um, so there's not any checking that these are the same type of thing, not any checking that, um, that they're both what the function so is. So what happens if you put a string in there? That is a good question. It tells me it could not raise it to the power. It could not take the string raised to the power of an integer. Yeah. My guess is that, <coughs> so, so raising things to the power of an integer is something that's really useful to optimize. I mean, because if you're just, yeah, I mean, so I, I would expect that to be in some lower level language. So even though it's giving us where that error occurred, it's not telling us where in Python code that happened. I'm guessing there's, there was a, that, that the C code made a check. But there was a way to convert a string to a, a number, right? So that you could convert that 3.0 or something. Yes, so I could do this as like this. I 
emotional. You're getting more and more complicated. But you're still doing it. I mean, but you're, but you're still, um, yeah, and so this means Of course, if you do this, okay, good, that gives an error. Oh, good. Is there any way to enforce argument type? I start. In a function? So, yeah, um, like you could, you could do a function, um, must be in its in x and then every instead of say if type of x is equal to ints raise an exception or throw an exception that goes under that raise all hell there's um, not a way to do it like intrinsically in the function definition you have to manually no type check so the only so, thing that oh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so, so Python three point five will add um, type on annotations, which this is actually by design. If the thing you're working with, you can do things like an integer mm -hmm. and treat it like an integer, and if that gives you an error like this did, so be you have an error. But let's say this is an integer. Let's say this is. Uh, complex number, let's say this is a, um, no, the integers are constrained to be just 32 bytes, or 32 bits, or some set size. They're not the built-in integers. Um, it's kind of the style of programming in Python that you just work with them as though they're what you expect. But well, it's, it's not as big a deal with like a simple type, but if you're working with objects and you're doing like a dependency object. Or something. So this is called duct typing. Yeah. Um, in, in the sense that if it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, you treat it like a duck. Right. So if you can call the methods on it, and I'm not being, and I'm, and I'm not making this up, if you can call methods on it um, that work, it has everything defined that you think it should, then you go with it. That's not the safest way to do it. Um, and this, this is the complete opposite approach of a language like C Sharp or Java. So yeah, it, it, it's a different kind of philosophy. But you know, PHP has a little bit of ability to, to check for object types and stuff. Well, it does. So you can you can check if something. I just I just checked if something was the same type as what I expected. Uh, you can check if something is a subclass of another. Have you done programming? Okay. Those capabilities do exist. They're just not commonly. I think the assertion statement is the uh, faster way rather than so, give something then raise Yeah, so, some so instead of. There is this assert x. Well, how about. Well, this is a nice thing. Is not ints. Sounds like it shouldn't work, but. Alright, let me define that. Must be ints 32. Okay, I may have. Wait. <laughs> Is it? Okay. Logic was right, just its opposite. Okay, that does it. Ah. So. It's quicker, but I don't know if asserts are ever taken out for if you opt, if you run the thing through something to optimize it. Um, I know that's the case in other languages. I don't use asserts, but yeah. So 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 there's, and you can see how helpful the error is. Uh, you can add a comma and a string to the assertion statement. This is a weird kind of, it's not quite a function, but x is not ints. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, I just uh, Googled it. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs>
Yes, if you would catch statutes. Okay, so, yes. but just to get back to the function definition. Mm -hmm. Presumably there are other defs you can do, and you can define other things besides function, or not? So you can define functions, and when you're making a class, you can define um, functions within the class that are just called methods, but essentially the same thing. Um, but, but, yeah. but essentially it's the word def plus the parentheses that tells the code, tells Python that you have defined a function. Yes, right. you can actually, and you can actually do it with this. Oh, that, that's, that's fine. But the, that's a very long line. Um, yeah, so really, this colon signifies that you're starting like a block. Um, not quite the same as a block in Fortran and C, but because scoping is different. Um, but yeah, so it, def, the name of the function, any um, parameters. But I mean, the parentheses, you have to have those two, right? It's not square brackets, it's not wiggly brackets. Oh yes, it has to be. It has to be parentheses. Yeah. Yeah. Which I think is the... And so when you have a list item, you refer to the list item with parentheses too, right? No, brackets. Brackets. Yeah. Okay. So going up here, yeah, this was in brackets. So, so both lists and, and dictionaries use the brackets. Okay. Okay. So you can do some math. You can do some take away hypotenuse, a little step from there, and do like min's method or something. Well, actually, I guess loops. We get it. So, a simple loop in um, my list, I think, was defined. A simple loop in Python would be to say for some item in my list, do something to that some item. So this is the same as a for each loop in other languages. Um, alternatively, and this is one example of keeping the language simple. Sometimes you want to know you're on the, fir the first item, second item, third item. An example of keeping it simple is that there is an enumerate function. that gives you accounts. So for instance, for here, this will say the counts that you've done for the loop um, with a bit of space, as well as the item in the loop. So the zeroth item is one, first item is two, so on. There's actually many times where you don't even have to use a number even when you're going over the whole list that was. Yeah. Well, that's for, for I, right? If you just did for two, for example, would it do the two? Uh, this is an I. Yeah. But what happens? Okay, so, 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 okay, so you're every, just going to go through the whole list. What if you only wanted to print the first <coughs> four items in the list? So I suppose. All right, so you can two, do I, two through six or something like that? Yeah, so one way to do this. So you want zero through uh, four. Yeah. Or is it zero through three, including right. three? Um, it's, 
there is what's called splicing notation. Wait. Yeah. For you know, the first four items. This is 0 through 4, not including 4, which is number 5 in the list. Okay, maybe I shouldn't use numbers for this. The fifth, or the. Yeah. Okay, but now you printed the, the list. One. You printed the list rather than the. Yeah, so if I want to do that here, I could do bracket 0 through 4. Okay. Anything. Actually, lists, dictionaries, anything that you can iterate over, files, um, can be in the for loop. Can what you use like range, like for i in range, and then 0 to 3, and then print that list item? Yes. So, a use, another useful function for i in Range gives you every number, um, and this is slightly differently in Python 2 and 3. Gives you every number up to the one you give it. So here I would give you four numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3. And let me print i to the 8th, just to do something more interesting. So 0 to the 8th, 1 to the 8th, 3, 2 to the 8th, 3 to the 8th. Um, this takes more, so you could say, starting with 4, going up to 10. You could say starting with 4, going up to 10, skipping every 2. Um, yeah, so range, in Python 2 will generate a list. In Python 3 will generate something slight, more, slightly more efficient rather than generating all the things. So, for instance, why not? Oh, actually, that is a lot. That might be a little too much for my web browser. Okay, I just realized I should have done that. Oh, God, stop it. Stop. Okay. So, don't type that unless you're really confident how much RAM you have. How much RAM do I have? <laughs> okay, I still have 25 gigs free. I don't. I, I think I. Okay. Chrome is very laggy right now, so I'm going to run this again. So my point was that that can be done efficiently in Python 3 without using up a lot of memory. But displaying it means it's in memory. So that was not a good thing to do. Well, OK, so if I do this, that doesn't display anything. I can do that. And it'll take some time. Not much time, but it runs. So if you do it in Python 2, it has to make a whole list. Or it makes a whole list. So there's four loops, and there's no parentheses required run anything in here, um, unless you call a function. While loops, let's say i equals 0. While i is less than 4, print i, um, and print i. So while loops are similar, while some condition is true, go through the loop. And hopefully it's not an infinite loop, but same in any other program language, um, but no parentheses required. So that's just the loops, the for loops syntax and the 
in parentheses required. If statements like what? <coughs> what do I have? If a is less than three, prints it is smaller. Else if is one word. A is equal to three, prints a is three, yay. Else, none of the above. So, if statements, else if, else, um, that from other languages works with these keywords and no parentheses required. Same as with the function definitions, you could make them one line usually not something you want to do, um, just for aesthetic reasons. So, okay. So, overview of Python as a language, how you use it. The uh, thing I want to go into that may be different if you're used to C or IDL, um, just to run it, things, stuff. Yeah, so I'll just throw into programming. The core concept of this, here's a little schematic of, you see the watch, you see, and hopefully don't see very often, all the machinery behind it. Object-oriented programming is a strategy of hiding that machinery. So it's about information hiding. Python <coughs> takes a lot of these concepts, <coughs> it does not do them well, like, it, it, it does not do them well in the sense that the language does not enforce it. Um, so, this internal stuff, even in object oriented programming um, in Python, is not necessarily hidden, but it's still, or it's hidden by convention. So, I mean, objects, when the program exists in Python, you've actually been using, actually seen a bit of this when I did. Took the imaginary component of A. Um, A is an object. You're finding properties of it. If I take the conjugate, well, use tab to complete that since I won't bother to spell it. Right. The conjugate is calling um, something that the A object knows it can do to itself. So, the useful thing in object programming is to think of your variables, or the data in the variables, to have some type, and they're able to, you're able to interact with them. So, here's a little schematic of shapes, uh, of shape being a type that has, every, every shape has different capabilities. Sorry, every shape has these capabilities. And here are three examples of shapes. Triangle is one of them that has its own capabilities on top of any of the other shapes. So, yeah. so this is so I'm not going to go into how you actually make objects besides to say that you use the class uh, use the class keyword and then things over. Um, except to say that they exist, things will give you classes, the, um, the integers and the strings and whatnot are themselves a type of class. Yeah, I think C was a string. And it's a string with various methods, including, I can count the number of O's, is I believe how this works. Yeah. So the string could be a, um, it could be an ASCII encoded string, so each byte represents one character. It could be a Unicode string, where maybe one to four bytes or more represents each character. It doesn't matter to you. What matters is how many of them are hoes. So there is information hiding. 
um, that's doable. So when we take a variable dot something, um, a lot of times that's object oriented programming going on. So yeah. the next thing. Skip the round for a bit. There is my numeric create a list of numbers. So I said that there's no simple so so that's an object during program concept. There is also functional programming that's in use here. Um, it's not a functional programming language, like half scale or list, but, it's a, but there's influence. And I wanna, my list of numbers, I wanna show that by giving an example. Of an operation, well, let's say you wanna do to this list of numbers. And this is actually a really nice, convenient thing that Python wants. I want the number squared. I can write that very simply as I want a list of each value in here squared for each value in this list. This is called list comprehension. Um, it kind of so effect you're squaring every value in here. Whether or not that makes sense for everything in there, it has to actually run that and find out. If you have strings, it won't make sense. But I want to point that out as a um, quick way to to do simple operations. This is equivalent to um, mapping a function onto a list. Mapping a function is what you would call it if you came from, if you did Pascal or um, other functional languages. Is value an arbitrary yes. label? I mean, you could have said list x squared for x in whatever. Yes. files, you want to call the function, uh, the open function <coughs> in the, for your LMD files, and you want to be able to put that into JSON files for a website you're making. So you want to be able to use the same function in two, from two different um, codes that do two different things, you don't want them to conflict. This is something you get to, in, in C this is very bad. When they have the same name, you know right away you have conflicts. In IDL, you don't know right away. You're just calling the wrong one without realizing it. Um, in Python, and in C++, and in other languages, the and in C, the, the, the convention is to simply rename the methods. C++, and Java, and other languages, and Python will do that kind of nicely for you. Here, C 
some name that you pick with a dot is what you can use to rename it. In, in uh, Java, these are called packages, and Python, these are modules. So these things can be written, uh, modules can be written in, um, in C or Python, or potentially other languages, .NET, C Sharp. I'll show, so I'm sure everyone has it, because it's built into Python. I'll show the math module, or, um, yeah, the math module. You can see what's in there by doing the lazy thing, letting the tab completion tell you, math dot, and then tab. And you have a lot of stuff. So if you want the error function, or if you want the floating point absolute value, or if you want pi, just enter. So this is the math module. There are others. Let's say you want to open, um, you want to write JSON files, there's a module for that. You want to reduce CCD images and astronomy, there's a module for that. Um, you want to do the scientific libraries to use next time. So, as an example, I think the best one. I think the best code is one where you don't do anything and just let someone else figure that, figure that out. So, uh, if you spell it right. So this would be my preferred way of figuring out the using Pythagorean theorem, just use the one built in the Python. An advantage of using code that's in other modules, this one in particular is written in C. Other ones may be written in Python and may later be ported, or may later be written in C or Fortran, but you still call them, um, but you still use them in Python like you have been before. Um, so there's a lot of uh, good ability to separate out your code to be able to optimize it that way. So hopefully this um, makes a little sense of why it's. Um, how a small core language can be useful for more than just taking the exponents of stuff. And there are other ways, and I think it's worth saying, all these modules are very well documented. Well, depends on the module, but most of them are very well documented. Most of the ones in common use are very well documented. Even just return the sign of facts here. Yeah. So, another way to use imports, two ways that I won't recommend very often is you can say from a module import some name. And if I do that, Cosine of, I don't know, math.pi over 4 or 3 to 0.5. So, and I can look up the help for cosine, and I can see, oh, I can see now it's a little function. So, I would recommend that too much, but it's kind of nice. You can at least see where the function is coming from. If you do something like this, all these things will be imported. Um, 
and there you have no idea what you have no idea uh, what thing what variables you use you might be over writing what's in the math module um, so it makes your code a little unclean because it's all um, potentially confused what came from what module if you're importing multiple things applications in it, you can make websites in it, you can make servers for the websites in it, um, you can make package managers, you can make music players, whatever you'd like. It's free and open source, which means there's a broad community not only using it, but fixing it, um, identifying problems in it from both a computer science standpoint as well as um, like theoretical standpoint, as well as people able to actually make it useful and helpful. So things like type annotations and matrix um, multiplication operator are things that um, people have been clamoring for for a while and it's taken like some kind of court of public opinion in the open source community to get them in. Um, but that happens and you're not guaranteed that with closed source language like, um, like IDL or, um, or MATLAB. So. And if you don't want to look like if your favorite if your programming language scientific use looks like it was looks like the GUI was from the 80s, it's probably because it was. Here, people actually use this and use it um, for a wide variety of stuff. So, yeah, a mixed thing is a loosely typed that has performance implications. Um, that will probably go into more next time. This programming communication is being that it's slow, um, as all languages like this is, as IDL is at some level. Um, so, I think that what you made, that's why you rewrite it in C if you need the performance. And the other disadvantage I want to mention is that there are really two versions of Python. I've been trying to use Python 3 throughout this. Um, it's backward, Python 3 is backwards incompatible, which means that there's a lot of code room for Python 2. Um, so they basically removed a lot of cruft and like, why the hell do we name it like that? It doesn't fit any of the other names. And I'm not, I'm not joking, there are like, um, just things that they realize while they're breaking backward compatibility, they might as well clean up the language. The biggest problem with porting is that Python 3 does international characters much a deeper level. Um, so you can use things like emojis, you can use things like um, extinct languages in your Python code, as long as there's a Unicode character for it. Um, or even better, you can use something that's just not a Latin character. Python 2, that's not necessarily the case, and it's not the case that that will work with all the libraries. Um, so this was the major backward incompatible change that just, they're breaking everything for that so that might as well go through broke. But one of the things, if prints, if you get errors related to prints without parentheses, you're probably working with Python 2 code. So that's a um, big sign for Python 2. Yeah, I think that's it. So that's my introduction to Python and going over this. So, any questions? Can I come up? Is this supposed to be a stopping point? Yeah. Yeah. So tomorrow we're going to cover NumPy and uh, the flooding language contract plug it. And uh, so we said this in the email before, but I'm not sure how many people actually read emails, <laughs> especially emails that long. Um, 
So this is the chapter or lecture one of this J.R. Johansson's very nicely done uh, tutorial. Zero is about some uh, philosophy stuff about scientific research or what it means. Um, and uh, this one is the, the one just just showed. And we're going to cover lecture two and lecture four tomorrow. But we're only going to just maybe go through uh, it very quickly and then go on with our own stuff. So I would really appreciate if you at least take a glimpse through these two and ask any questions you may have. Because it's all about uh, the clear clearance of the clarity of, of knowledge. And you have to be able to understand what each line of code means in order to proceed and, and mentally uh, appreciate it and understand it. So um, if you still have any questions about today's lecture, this lecture one will give a very nice um, video of it. And uh, um, two and four. So before that, uh, after that, uh, we'll have to see you tomorrow. So, uh, one thing that would be nice, actually, if you can make sure that typing this, well, I guess these two? Yeah. yeah, if you can if you can type all these and not get errors, you're good. Otherwise, see one of us. Okay, not fine. That's required by Matt Butler. Sorry. I guess sci fi. I don't know if sci fi is required by any of Thank you.